We're going to continue with part three of the biology EOC review. Number 24 says proteins are large macromolecules composed of thousands of subunits. The structure of the protein depends on the sequence of, okay, what are those subunits of proteins? What do we code for? And they have to line up with the ribosome. Those are amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Remember, we take our mRNA codons to the codon table and it tells us which amino acid is going to be picked up and taken to the ribosome to be assembled. They're held together by peptide bonds to form a long polypeptide and then a protein. So amino acids are the building blocks or the subunits of proteins. Number 25. It says use the pictures below to answer the questions. We have a cell, an organ, and a tissue. Which shows the correct order from simplest to most complex? We know the cell is the smallest unit that is a living thing. So the cell is the simplest. A group of cells working together with a similar function form a tissue. Okay. Groups of t different tissues working together. Form an organ, like you have epithelial tissue and maybe some muscle tissue. There's the heart, there's, or there's even blood tissue, endocrine tissue. Different tissues together make up that organ. That one kind of looks like maybe a liver. Um, and our group of organs together make up an organ system. Like that brain and the spinal cord and the Peripheral nerves, and all those, they make up the nervous system, or the heart, veins, arteries, capillaries. They make up the circulatory system. So we go cells, to tissues, to organs, to organ systems, to our organism, our multicellular organism. So this one would have to start with cell, so we know it's going to have to start with cells. So that means we can automatically eliminate B and D which gives us a better chance of getting it correct. Then we have cell organ tissue or cell tissue organ. Well, groups of cells working together make up a tissue. Then the groups of tissues work together to make organs. So organs are the more complex. A would be our correct answer. Number 26 says the diagram below represents a fat molecule. It's telling us it's a fat. A fat molecule belongs to which category of organic molecules? And it's like a big, scary, complex something or another there, but don't let that scare you. It tells you right there it's a fat molecule. We know that fats are lipids. Fats are lipids. So we don't, don't even have to look at that picture if it's too scary. Or if it didn't tell us a fat, we remember lipids look like ladders. Then lipids look like ladders. So that one kind of looks like a ladder. So that would be a lipid. Fats are lipids. Number 27 says that cellular respiration involves a series of chemical reactions. Which of the following is the primary way that enzymes affect these reactions? Well, how do enzymes affect reactions in general? Enzymes speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. So enzymes speed up. So it doesn't even really matter that we're talking about cellular respiration. They just want to know what the enzyme does. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions. So A says decrease the pH of the product. Nope. B says increase the rate of reaction. So B sounds like an enzyme. It increases the rate of reaction. C says takes the place of oxygen. Nope. Um, D says change the location of the reactions. No, it doesn't move them around in the cell. Um, it's going to increase the rate of reaction. It's going to speed up those reactions. That's the job of an enzyme. So B is the correct answer. Number 28, we're looking at adaptations. It says, which bird food is best for swimming? Okay. And there's claws for catching things. Those are spread out uh, for not squishing down and stuff. And that's some, that looks like an ostrich foot there. Swimming would need to be able to push water back. The webbing in this foot would make that more suitable for swimming. So A would be our correct answer there. Number 29 says the illustration below shows the morphological changes of two species. Okay. So we started out with this ancestor species, and then we branched off right here. We kind of got a little bit lighter there, and a little bit darker one there. And then as it got 
uh, we got through here, we got ladder and ladder to make it species one. In species two, um, evolved to get darker spots on it. Which statement explains why species one and species two are different? We looked at speciation earlier. That means there's something in their environment that was different that caused more with a certain trait to survive in that area somehow. And then that was the that would be the one that adapted and changed over time to um, diverge from one another. That would be divergent evolution. So A says an individual changed itself to suit the environment. Well, it didn't change itself. B says natural selection can cause gradual speciation changes. That sounds good. C says interbreeding of species 2 results in no genetic mutations. Well, there are mutations that changes over time. Um, C says extinction of ancestor species occurs as a result of interbreeding. Uh, no, not exactly. Natural selection can cause gradual speciation changes. That would be our best answer. Maybe the environment that these developed in. Maybe you had, I don't know, lighter color flowers, lighter color trees or something that, that allowed them to camouflage. Maybe these were in an environment with darker color um, trees or flowers. So the ones that were darker survived and passed that trait on. And in the lighter environment, the ones that were lighter colored were less likely to get eaten because they could camouflage. And they survived and passed those traits on. Okay. So B is the best answer there. Number 30 says a termite population was sprayed with a certain brand of insecticide. After being sprayed, the number of surviving termites within the populations were counted and recorded as a percentage of the total. This process was repeated until a total of six generations of termites had been sprayed. And the results were shown in the table. The termite generations 1 through 6, the percent of surviving termites after spraying. The first time they sprayed, only 5% survived. So... 95% were killed at that point. Most of them were, were killed by the spray. Generation 2, 10% survived. 25 until we got all the way up to Generation 6, and 80% survived, so only 20% were susceptible to the spray at that point. How did that happen? So which statement best explains why later generations had a higher percentage of termites that survived? Okay, remember that survival of the fittest some of them maybe had a genetic variation that allowed them to be resistant to that spray. Well, those are the ones that survived here. So they um, they passed, they made it and passed on that trait of being able to survive the insecticide to their offspring. So they were more, in that next population, that next generation, there were more that had that, that allele for being able to be resistant to the pesticides. So then at that generation, more of them survived again because they were resistant. And then that resistance trait got passed on to their offspring until we ended up with a population that had more and more of that population being resistant, carrying that allele for being resistant to the pesticide or expressing that allele. So more became resistant due to survival of the fittest and passing that trait on. So A says earlier generations had several members that were old and weak. And B says earlier generations had smaller numbers of termites than later generations. C says later generations were able to live through the spraying because they were used to it. D says later generations were the offspring of the termites that had been more resistant to the spraying. So they passed that trait of being more resistant onto their offspring. D is our best answer. 31 says, how is natural selection in the evolution of long necks and giraffes best explained? Again, this is another survival of the fittest. Whoever's best suited for their environment is going to survive longer and pass on their, their genetic traits to their offspring. So A says, shorter neck giraffes were killed by long neck giraffes. Nope. B says, giraffe necks grew longer because the bone structure in the animals. That's kind of what Lamarck would have said. that They acquired that trait because they used it. Um, C says giraffes with longer necks survived because they were better suited to their environment. Yes, long neck giraffes uh, mated only with other long neck giraffes. Now, I don't think they were choosing measuring necks to mate. Um, so C says giraffes with longer necks survived because they were better suited for the environment. Yes, they were able to reach the 
leaves up high so when food got scarce they could still eat. And then more of those longer neck giraffes survived, so they ended up mating with each other and passing on that trait to their offspring. So C is our best answer there. Number 32 says the Arctic fox and gray wolf are two examples of animals that change the color of their fur with the seasons. In the summer, the animals are brownish color. In the winter, they turn white. The change in color helps the animal to survive. Which of the following provides the best explanation for this change? Well, why would uh, being brown in the summer and being white in the winter, what kind of advantage would that give? What happens in the winter in the Arctic? We're going to have a lot of snow. Snow is white. So the color change helps protect them from predators. It's um, not going to help them raise their young, other than the fact that they're still alive to do it. Um, helps them regulate body temperature. Not really. It would have to be the other way around because darker colors are going to absorb more heat. Um, color change helps them be seen from a great distance. No, it's doing the opposite. It's camouflaging them so they're less obvious to predators. So the color change protects them from predators. A would be our best answer. That's an example of adaptation camouflage. Number 33 says study the table below. That's the student's observations of characteristics. We have organisms X, W, X, Y, and Z and characteristics 1 and 2. Characteristics of W is it has teeth and scales. Could be an alligator. Uh, X has reproduces and grows. Y has hair and moves. X has hair, it's probably a mammal. Z has feathers and eats, so it has feathers, it's going to be a bird. A student records observations, characteristics for the four organisms based on this student's observations. Which organism has two characteristics? Of all living things. Which one can we not narrow down at all? Because all living things have those characteristics. That would be X. It says reproduces and grows. Two characteristics of life there. Living things are able to reproduce. And living things are able to grow. Grow and develop over time. So organism X B would be our correct answer. Number 34 says the following table is characteristics of five different types of animals. Use the information in the table to answer the following questions. So let's see what the question says. An animal has 20 body segments and has no mandibles, which are jaw bones. Which type of animal is it? So let's see. We we're looking for segments and mandibles. So segments has 20 body segments. So let's see. Fewer than five, five or more. Fewer than five, fewer than five, five or more. So five or more is either going to be this one or this one. So if it has 20 body segments, it's going to be either there or there. And then it says it also has no mandibles. So we'll come down here and look at mandibles. Okay, this one's five or more segments, so that would be 20, could be the 20 segments, but it has mandibles. This one says it has no mandibles, so five or more segments and no mandibles. So type V or type 5 would be our correct answer. So D is our correct answer there. 35, according to the classification key, what characteristic does a wolf have in common with a caribou? The wolf is here, caribou is here. The last place that they were connected was way back here at animals with backbones. They're both vertebrates, so a backbone would be our correct answer. 36, the table below shows the classification of four animals according to their classification. Which of the following animals are most closely related? So they all start out the same. Animalia, Chordata, Mammalia. So up to that point, they're all the same. Okay, Carnivora, Rodents, and Carnivore. So these two are still related, and these two in the middle are still related. Um, Canidia, Felidia. So canines and felines, they branch off there. These two are still together at, at family. They're both in the family, Meridia. So R and S would be more closely related. D is the correct answer. 37, Trish constructed an autonomous key to help identify the reptiles and amphibians living in a certain area. Which phrase describes lizards? An animal with scaly skins and a shell? Nope. Animal with scaly skins and legs and no shell? Yes. Uh, it has legs. 
no shale and scaly skin.